This is a tutorial on using the Headway Research Spinner in the Flexible Clean Room. Before you start setting up the spinner, it's a good idea to go over to the hot plate and turn it on so that it'll have time to stabilize by the time you're ready to use it. A few seconds after you turn it on, you'll see there's some green numbers and red numbers. The red number is the actual temperature and the green number is the set point. We're going to use 95 degrees. To change the set point, push one of the up or down keys until you see the little blinking light. Then use the up or down keys to, to set the temperature that you want. Make sure your gloves are clean and dry before touching any of these buttons. Also try not to touch the other two buttons or you may change some settings. The spinner is capable of speeds up to 10,000 RPM although we rarely go above 6,000 RPM. It is very important that you are wearing safety glasses while you're spinning in case a wafer flies off and shatters. You should always have the lid closed during spinning, although I will have it open for demonstration purposes. The programming controls for the spinner are up above in the head casing of the wet bench. A green foot switch down below starts the automatic spin process. The red foot switch kills the process if necessary. There is a vacuum hole in the center of the motor shaft. It is very, very important that you never allow any photoresist or solvents to go down this hole. Any liquids going down this hole will wind up clogging the vacuum circuit and ruining the motor bearings, the vacuum sensor, and the vacuum solenoid. So it is imperative that you use a chuck that is suitable for the size of wafer or chip that you are going to be spinning. But more on that later. It saves a lot of cleanup time if you first line the spinner with foil. To the left of the solvent bench there's a roll of foil and you tear off a big square sheet of it. The idea is to cover up as much of the bowl as possible on the inside. It'll make cleanup a whole lot easier. Poke a hole in the center of the foil so that the shaft can come through. And then tuck in the rest of the foil so that it's all within the bowl so that you'll still be able to close the lid of the spinner. To open or close the spinner door, press the little black push button in the knob. All of the chucks have a raised center portion with a vacuum scroll in it. You want your wafer or chip to completely cover the entire raised portion of the chuck. This chuck here is the perfect size for this chip as you can see the chip completely covers the raised portion of the chuck. If you use a chuck that is too big, resist will wind up getting sucked into the vacuum hole. A chuck that's too small won't have enough surface area to effectively hold your sample, so it may fly off during spinning. The underside of the chuck has a D-shaped hole. Make sure there is a rubber o-ring in place in this hole before installing. Take note of the orientation of the flat on the spinner shaft and line it up right before pressing the chuck down onto the shaft until it is seated. The o-ring makes a seal between the chuck and the shaft. In the drawer below is where you will find most of the photoresists. We provide this AZ1512 resist, which is a good general purpose positive resist. In a positive resist, those portions which are exposed to UV light are what washes away during the subsequent development step. To the right of the spinner are some disposable polyethylene pipettes. These work well for dispensing resist onto the chip or wafer. Before you can start spinning, you need to program the spinner. To the left of the spinner controls are some laminated cards that give you information on programming the spinner. It also shows the list of recipes that are programmed into the spinner already. If you are using one of the standard recipes, it is very easy. If you need to make a custom recipe, I will get into that later. For now, let's choose recipe 3, which ramps up at a rate of 1000 RPM per second until it gets to 4000 RPM, and it holds at 4000 RPM for 45 seconds. Then it ramps down at the same 1000 RPM per second rate until 0. It maintains vacuum for an additional 3 seconds, then it's done. When vacuum is in auto mode, it pulls vacuum during the entire cycle, but it is also possible to manually turn vacuum on and off. If you want to turn vacuum manually on, push this vacuum on auto button. It will toggle back and forth between manually on and auto. So say you want to use recipe 3, but you find that it's sitting on recipe 8. All you need to do is hit recipe and then 3, and that's it. Now it's in recipe 3, 
and it says ready. It's ready to use. The hot plate's showing 95 degrees now, nice and stable. So now we're ready to start spinning. You should have everything you'll need together here. Your tweezers, your wafer or chip, the photoresist, and some wipers. Use your tweezers to pick up your wafer or chip and set it on the chuck. Use your tweezers to scoot it around until it looks very well centered. If it's not well centered and it's sitting way off center, it's likely to go flying when you start spinning. Okay, now you're ready to start dispensing some resist onto the chip. Open the bottle and tilt the bottle, squeeze the pipette and stick it into the resist and allow the resist to slowly flow up into the pipette. That will help you to keep from getting bubbles in the, in the resist. If you do have a bubble, you can squeeze it out onto the foil. When you see there are no bubbles left in the pipette, start dispensing it onto the chip. Try to cover about two thirds to three quarters of the face of the chip. The spinner tilts slightly towards the rear, so start towards the front of the sample when you're dispensing it. Hit the green start button to start the process. You don't want to waste time after dispensing the resist before you start spinning. Otherwise you may get a skin on the surface which will cause streaks in your resist. Bubbles and pieces of dust on your wafer will also cause streaks. Note that I'm showing this with the spinner open, but it should be closed during an actual spin. It's a good idea to step to the right while you're spinning, just to keep your body out of the airflow path to minimize dust particles, also for safety. You can watch a countdown clock up on the spinner controls. When it gets to zero, it will hold for a couple more seconds before it releases vacuum, then you're done. I didn't do any kind of cleaning on this chip before I spun it, so you can see a few faint streaks. On a square chip like this, it's normal to have some strange looking areas in the corners due to turbulence. You generally are looking for a nice even color across the whole center area of the chip. For normal resist, you can put the sample directly on the black surface of the hot plate. For other materials like SU8, you would want to use the little sheet metal aluminum trays which are sitting to the right of the hot plate. These protect the surface from materials like SU8 which are likely to stick to the surface of the hot plate. Photoresist is usually really easy to wipe up with a wiper dampened in acetone. I like to use 5 minutes at 95 degrees C. You can use higher temperatures but they must be shorter. If you heat it at too high of a temperature for too long you can damage the photosensitive compounds in the resist and you can also eventually cross-link the resist, which will make it impossible to work with. Now I'll talk about programming custom recipes, and also how to verify that the standard recipes haven't been changed accidentally. All of the standard recipes have just two steps. Even most of the custom recipes have only two steps. But it is also possible to make a custom recipe with up to nine steps. Each step has just three things you will be entering. Speed, ramp, and terminate time. In a typical two-step recipe, the first step will include the speed which you want to get to, the acceleration rate to get to that speed, entered in RPMs per second, and then the length of time that you want it to hold at that speed. So if you want to make a custom recipe, use recipe 8 or 9 so you don't mess with any of the standard recipes that are entered in there already. To enter recipe 8, hit the recipe button, then 8. Now you are in recipe 8 and you can make changes to recipe 8. Now hit the step button and then hit the number 1 key. Now you're ready to review what's entered for step 1. Now hit the speed key which will tell you what speed is entered for step 1. Say you wanted to enter 500 RPM. You would punch in 5, 0, 0 and then enter. If you hit the same speed button, it toggles now to ramp. Remember that you won't actually make any changes unless you hit enter. So if you wanted to change this, you would put the numbers that you want, then hit enter. Otherwise, just move on to the next step, which is terminate. After you hit terminate, this is where you would enter how long in seconds that you want the spinner to hold steady at the RPM you just entered for step one. If you want to change this value, just punch in the, the new numbers and hit enter. So in a normal two-step process, the second step will just be getting it back down to zero. So you would enter zero as the speed for the second step, and then whatever ramp you want to come back down, and then the terminate time would be the time that's left over after it gets to zero. 
So if you, if you want to keep the sample on the chuck for maybe one more second after it stops spinning, you would put maybe one second for the terminate time of the second step. You can also add up to nine steps if you want to. So if you can have uh, maybe a first step where it spreads the resist, the second step might bring it up to a, a higher RPM, and then the third step would be getting it back down to zero. So since someone may have entered three or four steps on recipe eight or nine, the one that you're changing, and you might only be entering a two-step process, you would need to check steps three and four to make sure zero is entered for the RPMs and terminate times for any steps that follow your recipe. Once you are done programming all of the steps, hit step zero. Step zero gets you out of the programming process and you're ready to use the new recipe you just programmed into it. If you get totally lost during programming, hit step zero and it gets you right back to the normal operation. Please don't mess with any of the other function or system parameter keys. These are for changing things like when it applies a vacuum to the chuck, etc. You should know that for any resist, the resist spins out thinner as the spin speed is increased. Here's some spin curves for some SPR36 series resists. For many brands of positive resist, the first two numbers of the resist signify which series of resist it is. Then the last two digits usually correspond to the thickness if spun at 4000 RPM. SPR3612, for instance, in the blue curve, spins out to about 1.2 microns at 4000 RPM. Going slower increases the thickness and going faster decreases the thickness. A thinner resist allows for higher resolution lithography, while a thicker one might work better for doing liftoff metallizations of thicker metal films but with less resolution. Now I'll go into some problems you might have during spinning. One problem you might encounter is streaks in the resist. They usually look like little comets that fan out from the center towards the edge. Most comet-shaped streaks are due to dust particles that land on the surface prior to or during spinning. Avoid moving your arms around which can stir up dust. Step to the right before you hit the spin button, just so your body's out of the air path. Bubbles in the resist will also cause streaks. Squeeze out excess bubbles from the pipette before depositing the resist. If you do see a bubble in the resist after dispensing it, you can use the pipette to suck away the bubble or to scoot the bubble towards the edge of the wafer right before spinning. If you notice your resist is all lumpy and uneven, then most likely you are allowing too much time between dispensing and spinning. If it sits on the chuck too long prior to spinning, the resist can gel up or get a skin on it which makes it spread unevenly. Square cornered substrates will always have some unevenness in the corners due to air turbulence during spinning. If you hit the spin button and the sample goes flying, it probably means you have the wrong size chuck. But if you have carefully picked the right size chuck and it still takes off, it means that there's probably a vacuum problem. With the vacuum circuit operating normally, if the sample flies off, you should see this error code which means that it knows that there was a loss of vacuum. If the sample flies off, but you don't see this vacuum error code, it means there's a problem with the vacuum circuit in this, either in the spinner shaft or up in the head casing. If you do get this vacuum error warning, you can reset the spinner by hitting the green floor switch again. An easy way to verify if the vacuum circuit is working properly is to place your gloved finger lightly over the top of the spinner shaft to plug up that hole. Then hit the green button to start spinning. If it does not spin after a few seconds, press a little harder with your finger to create a better seal. If it starts to spin and you let go of the shaft, it should stop instantly if everything is normal and give a vacuum error warning. If, however, it keeps spinning, then that proves that the shaft is clogged or the vacuum circuit is messed up. If you feel that the shaft is clogged, please notify the lab supervisor right away. Please don't try to fix this yourself if you think it's clogged because it may actually cause more problems. If the vacuum shaft seems to test out okay vacuum wise, but your sample still flies off, other things you might want to check is to make sure that the O-ring is in the bottom of the chuck and also make sure that there's no little bumps of maybe a drop of resist on the bottom of your wafer that are keeping it from laying flat. If you are working with very tiny samples, way smaller than this one, please don't flood the resist completely over the sample. Try just to put the resist on top of the sample. That will really help in keeping resist from getting down the vacuum hole. If you're going to spin something other than normal photoresists, please contact the lab supervisor so we can go over special precautions that might be necessary. <laughs>
Thanks for watching. Thank you.